Hey, thanks for joining us here at the LifePoint Church YouTube page. Really quick, before the message, three things that you can do. Number one, subscribe. We want you to be the first to know when we're dropping new messages. Number two, interact. Hop in the comments and chat with us. We want to do this thing with you. And number three, share this message with someone you care about. And never forget, God loves you and he has a plan for you. Now enjoy the message. It is wonderful to be with you today. My name is Mike, and honestly, it's, it's an honor to be with you on this historic day. Uh, launching the second campus, that's so fantastic, and I get a chance to talk to you about family, and it's one of my very favorite topics, and so just kind of off the, off the top, I want to ask, show of hands, how many of you are firstborns? Okay, that's my tribe right here. Yeah, I, I recognize all the responsible people in the room. Well done. You were here on time. Good job. You, you were the compliant child. You were the experiment. Good, good work. How many of you are youngest children in the home? Anybody? Oh, yeah. You're the smiling ones, right? You guys, you guys have run the show from the beginning. I mean, honestly, you were raised by your best friends. Um, you, you, had, you had sugar cereal in your home. Is that not right? Like, by then, your parents just gave it up. They were like, fine, whatever you want, you know. Uh, I love that I get to talk about family because I'm, I'm a huge family guy. I, I actually love my family so much. And this idea of Instagram it gives us this idea that we want to post all of this, like the beautiful pictures, right? And so I do want to just show you one picture uh, from my Instagram feed. This is last year. We went to Hamilton together. And so this is us all kind of dressed up and best behavior. And, and it's just beautiful. So my kids are all moving into adulthood. My wife of 28 years, Jody, is just, you know, we're in that season right now. And so super fun. And, and that's kind of Instagram worthy. That's, that's what a lot of people, a lot of families, you know, show the very, very best. But there's crazy in family, is there not? Like, they're, like, like their family has all kinds of weird and crazy and dysfunction and whatever. My buddy was telling me this week that he had a cousin named Tuffy who got together romantically with his other cousin, Roro. Uh, and she is, you know, the manager of Chuck E. Cheese. And this feels like a biblical story, does it not? Like, this is so crazy. Um, those of you who know the Bible, think about the first family. Adam and Eve, right? Not exactly an Instagram-worthy family because Adam and Eve have two kids, Cain and Abel, and then what happens? Cain kills Abel, okay? That's like, that's not a good family values moment right there. Or you fast forward into King David and the life of King David. Man, his family, there was a royal mess is what that was because he had one son who forced himself on one of his daughters and that son gets killed by another one of his sons. You probably didn't know that story. It's in the Bible, it really is. Or like um, the one you might know about, King David had a son named Absalom. And Absalom was this really tall, broad-shouldered, good-looking, long hair, Fabio hair kind of a guy. He was the, the model for all of the romance novels. And, and what this guy did, Absalom, he rebelled against his father to try to take over the kingdom. And in this rebellion, he's leading a charge across this field. He's on a horse, and his hair, his long, beautiful hair, gets caught in the, t in the branches of a tree. So he's hanging there by his hair, and a general comes and stabs him through. And it, it reminded me exactly of the episode of Succession I watched last night. But I just want you to understand, like, like this craziness in family. There's so much that's awesome, and then there's a lot that's awful, and I want you to understand what God's doing through all of this is he's providing an opportunity, and it's an opportunity for us to learn patience and to learn belonging and to learn unconditional love. And so I hope you grab your notes. I hope you follow along today because whether or not you have kids or you have parents or you have a spouse or you have, uh, you know, uncles and aunts and cousins, or maybe you just have friends that you think are family, this message is for you. And we're going to get super practical, so I hope you, you follow along take, taking notes. But look, the verse that I want to start with says in Proverbs 11, those who bring trouble on their families inherit the wind. In other words, you get nothing in return. If you bring trouble on your family, there's nothing coming back your way. That's not what we want to bring. We don't want to bring trouble. What we want to bring is hope. So that's the first truth, is to embed hope, embrace hope for our families, especially... There might be some of you today that are feeling like, you know, I don't know if I have any strength left. I don't know if I have what it takes in order to make it through this season of my family's life. And so here are a couple of verses for you. The first one from Philippians 4.13 says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. My friends, I want you to understand whatever you're facing, whatever challenge, whatever trial, whatever difficulty you're facing, you are able 
because of Christ's strength working within you. He will provide your strength. Or that next verse on your outline, which says this, commit your way to the Lord, trust also in him, and he shall bring it to pass. So in other words, commit your family. Commit your relationships to the Lord. Commit your home to the Lord. And he's the one who's going to bring success. He's gonna bring victory. Why? Because of the praise that we've already offered today. Uh, We believe in a God of miracles. This is a house of miracles. We believe in Jesus who is present with us, who heals, who saves, who restores, who redeems. This is what we believe. So you are not alone in this, my friends. You've got the God of the universe on your side. But that brings us to sort of the next challenge with our families, which is this, to embed values into our families. So in other other words, we don't just want to look good on the outside. We want to drive value and strength all the way through to the foundation of our family. And so that requires intentionality and effort on our part. We want to embed the right values. And so if you're filling in the blanks, the first one that I would encourage you to do is to start with radical acceptance. That's the first value to embed in your home, radical acceptance. And what that means is you do this without limitation. You do this without a sense of limit. You're saying, I will accept those that God has placed in my home because I trust that he has a plan. He's putting us together for a reason. Now, there's this great scripture uh, I put on your notes. It's from 1 John 2, 9. And I grew up in the church. My parents took me to church early days. So I've known this verse for a long time. And here's what it says. It says, anyone who claims to be in the light but hates his brother is still in the darkness. Whoever loves his brother lives in the light and there is nothing in him to make him stumble. Well, it's a great verse, and, and the reason is because God is the light, and so if we're in the Lord, we're in the light, and that means we love. And, and so anyway, I've known this verse for a long time, and I am an oldest brother. I'm an older brother of a younger brother. How many of you have that situation in your home? You're an older brother to a younger brother. Anybody? Not too many people, just, just a few? Okay, well, then you're not going to resonate with this story because as an older brother, you know in the job description, you have to torture your younger brother. It's just a part of what this scene looks like. So one day, I was 10, my brother's 7, and we're in a playground with gravel. Like, uh, they don't even make playgrounds with gravel anymore, but, but they, it's gravel. And so I was picking up rocks, and I just decided it'd be fun to throw them at my brother. And so he's on the swings, and I'm just throwing rocks at him, talking to him, just we're hanging out, and he's not liking it. So he goes up on the slide, and I'm just throwing rocks, just kind of pelting him casually. And he's kind of running around, and I'm just walking after him like Pepe Le Pew, just throwing rocks at his head, you know. And he's getting so upset, and he's like, he's like stop it, stop it. He's like, I hate you. And then I pull out the verse. Oh, buddy, you can't hate me. The Bible says if you hate me, you're still in darkness. It's like, I don't want you to go to hell, bud. Like, you got to love me. And he was so frustrated. He runs around the corner. This is a true story. He runs around the corner of the school. I'm running after him, just throwing rocks. I turn the corner, and I meet this huge rock that he had thrown. It just hits me right in the forehead. And so I get stitches and a tetanus shot and I have to lie to my parents about the whole thing and it creates another scar on this ugly mug you have to look at. But that story did not turn out the way I had planned for that to go. I want, what I'm trying to say though is that the power of the scripture is true, that we are to love and the reason that we are to love in our homes, the reason why we're to have this radical acceptance in our homes is because this is the kind of love God has for us. Like God has radical acceptance for you. There's nothing you can do. There's no distance you can go. There's, there's no behavior you can I- exhibit that will prevent him from just loving you and accepting you just as you are. It's, a, it's an amazing reality. And the scripture says you gotta love your brother. The actual verse that, that's used in Greek, it means more than just your biological brother, but it doesn't mean less. So we're to bring this into our homes. And the reason is because God is love. See, the scripture talks about how while, while we were still sinners, while we were still so far from God, we never even thought about calling out to God. It was then that Jesus started pursuing you. It was then that he gave himself on the cross for you. It was him that he has pursued you in love. And so we are then to offer that same love to our families. And here's what I want you to know, because I know this is a a bit of a challenging topic. So please write this down and you can kind of mull over it. If you want to reach out to me for questions, but here's what radical acceptance looks like. Okay, radical acceptance for your kids 
is that you don't have to agree with all of their decisions. You don't have to approve of all of their choices, but you can accept them unconditionally because they're yours. Same thing with your parents. You don't have to agree with your parents' uh, political philosophy, because honestly, the older my parents get, the crazier their philosophy becomes. What I'm trying, though, to get you to see is you can accept them. You don't have to agree with everything. You don't have to approve of everything, but you can accept them without limit or condition because that's what God does for you. What radical acceptance means is that you simply say, you are mine and I am yours. And that means I accept you no matter what. Because when we fail to do that, there's heartache in our families. There's heartache in our relationships. And so the model that the Bible gives us to walk in is found in Ephesians 4.32, which says, be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as in Christ, God forgave you. Again, he's the model for everything we try to inhabit in the course of our relationships. And you've got these two feet to walk through your relational life with. You've got grace and you've got truth. And I want to encourage you, always lead with grace. Always lead with grace. By the way, Jesus, he is the full embodiment of both grace and truth. And he always led with grace. That was always his first step. And so I want that to to be in our homes as well. Now, the truth step brings us to the next truth, which is this, if you're filling in the blanks, build in thoughtful dialogue into your home. Build thoughtful dialogue. You might also want to write in the words authentic processing authentically, you want to build honest and careful dialogue into the relationships that are closest to you. And here's what we tend to do as humans. We tend to give our shortest answers or our worst responses to our family because they're family. And so I would encourage us to flip the script. I would encourage us to give our best answers and our most thoughtful responses to those who actually are closest to us, that we love the most. And there are a couple times today I want to be super vulnerable with you. This is one of those times. Uh, we've had to have some honest and thoughtful dialogue with my youngest uh, this week. On Monday, he got into a car accident, totaled his car. It's the second car he's totaled in two years. And, uh, and everyone's okay, thank God. But the reason why I bring it up is because, you know, you might want to steer clear of Woodenville for a while. Like you might want to drive around uh, because it's you know, not a safe space to be in. And, and so we're talking to my son and we're saying, buddy, like sit down. We have to have a conversation with you. Yes, I'm so glad nobody was hurt in this accident, but it's the second one. They're both your fault. Something has to change. And we had to use patience and we had to use some space, but we, we couldn't ignore the situation. We needed to bring this honest and thoughtful dialogue into that scenario. Does that make sense? And so that's what we do in our homes, in our families. The scripture says this in Ephesians 4, 26, in your anger, do not sin. You know, it is funny that the Bible never says that you're not to be angry. God recognizes that he has given us emotion and we have to like steward the the realities of our life by, by caring for our emotions. So he doesn't say, don't be angry. But in our anger, we're not to sin. We're to utilize the agency that God has given us to regulate our emotion. And to bring things down to a level where everyone can actually have a conversation, where our thoughts can actually be clear, that we can begin to articulate more carefully what it is that we're actually experiencing. Those are the things that we need to do. And so I want to encourage you, if you feel like you're getting flooded in a, rela- in a conversation with your spouse or with your child or your parent, feel free to do a time out and just call it out. You know, I'm feeling a little flooded at this point. Let's take a break. We'll pick it back up at dinner. Or let's, let's take a break right now and we'll, we'll come back together tomorrow after work or whatever it is. But just regulate where you are so that you don't end up entering into a place where you're out of control. You say things that you're gonna have to repent of later. Okay? So that's this reality around building thoughtful dialogue in. By the way, you probably already know this, but I'm convinced that one of the chief values that counseling provides for us is that safe space to have the hard conversation. Right? There's a third person present who's slightly detached from the situation and they help bring an emotional regulation over that conversation. That's an incredible value. So keep that in mind and that's why you know, counseling is a good opportunity for many of us 
But here's the most powerful verse for relationships in the family context. Ephesians 5.21 says, submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Right? Because we love Jesus, we're actually gonna be humble and gracious in submitting to one another in whatever this situation might look like. I happen to know a couple right now, the season of life they're in is they're caring for their older father who has dementia. And as the dementia progresses, it gets more antagonistic and more bizarre and more difficult for this couple to navigate. But there's such a beautiful couple submitting to one another because they honor Christ and they're honoring their father in that whole process. And it really is beautiful, even in the midst of heartache and challenge, you see so much beauty. That's what God has for us in our families. And it brings me to this next thing, which is to be proactive in character building. Be proactive in character building. In other words, this is the reason why God has placed us into homes in the first place. This is the reason why he allows us to develop within the context of homes and we don't just get harvested like, you know, from a field or something like, like, like it, this is his plan. And, and it's to develop character. And the scripture says this, Paul's talking here, he says, be imitators of God, therefore as dearly loved children and live a life of love just as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us as a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. Be imitators of God, therefore, he says, as dearly loved children. I remember uh, when my son Caleb was about four years old, I remember one night I had a couple of buddies over. We were hanging out, but it was time for Caleb to go to bed. So I went upstairs. I was tucking him in bed. And he was kind of squirmy and mischievous for a while and got him in bed. And, and then he looked up at me and he said, Dad, you, you have a friend named Matt and I have a friend named Matt. We're the same. And I was like, oh, that's, that's true, bud. That's really cool. And then he goes, and you have a friend named Christopher and I have a friend named Christopher. See, we, we really are the same. I was like, oh, bud. I gave him a big hug. And he goes, and dad, we even smell the same. And I'm like, oh, that's, that, is that a good thing? I don't know. Is that? <laughs> but you can see this little four-year-old heart. He just wanted to be like his dad. And could you imagine God responding to our hearts like that? Like that he sees us wanting to be imitators of him, that he sees us wanting to be like him, our heavenly father. And that's why the scripture says that. It says, be like this. And, and, and then model the experience that Christ, Christ gave himself, right? And so we're to give ourselves for those in our family. And I love the metaphor as dearly loved children because that's what you are. You are a dearly loved son. You are a dearly loved daughter of God most high. That is the truth. And so when it comes to character, the thing you already know, but you need to just make a new note is character is not taught, it's caught. You can't teach character. In fact, if you try to teach character without modeling character, you're gonna do yourself and your family a disservice. It's so much better to embody and to live the character that you want your children to have. Because they really are. There are little uh, identity thieves in your home. And they're going to steal your identity. And you are the one who gets to choose what kind of identity do you want them to steal? What is the character that you want them to embody? Right? That is what it looks like to be a parent in this situation. And the scripture says, My son, do not despise the Lord's discipline. Do not resent his rebuke because the Lord disciplines those he loves. As a father, the son, he delights in. Could you just circle the phrase delights in? In 28 years of ministry, that little phrase is the one I think Christians have the most trouble recognizing. That God delights in you. And so his discipline for you is going to be for your benefit to move you into the place of your greater abundance or your greater uh, proactivity and productivity, your greater effectiveness in the kingdom of God. He wants you to flourish. And so his discipline is gonna be kind and gentle, compassionate. It's gonna be guidance oriented. Do you understand that the Lord's discipline is not punitive at all? It's developmental. It's always for growth and progress. And so that's the kind of discipline that we're to embody in our homes. The scripture even says this in, in Ephesians 6, fathers do not provoke your children to anger by the way you treat them, rather bring them up with the discipline and instruction that comes from the Lord. 
And so that's what we want. As the Lord disciplines and guides us, we want to bring that same discipline and guidance into our home. And, and, and it's really a challenge, and I get this. I get that discipline is a challenge. It's a bit of a hot topic. But here's my recommendation. My recommendation is that none of us would discipline at the extremes, right? None of us would discipline at the extremes. So what does that mean? At the extreme, let's just say you're emotionally dysregulated. You're, you're furious. And so you explode, and you're screaming and yelling, and you're ranting and raving and cursing and, and all that stuff. And, and I want you to understand that that's a, a possibility. Some of you grew up under that kind of a reality. But I want you to understand that that doesn't produce the results you want it to produce, it's counterproductive because when your child sees you lose control, all they're hearing is your loss of control. You lose control, they lose respect. It, pr- pr- it produces the opposite of what you want. So that's one extreme. The other extreme is this. You just avoid all discipline whatsoever. You never wade in. You never have the hard conversation, right? You, you just avoid So I want you to understand the extremes are no good, but somewhere in the middle is your, you let the Lord lead you in those conversations. You let his guidance lead you and you have those appropriate, thoughtful, but developmental conversations around building character. That's the purpose of discipline, okay? Scripture says this, people who accept discipline are on the pathway to life. In other words, we win when we have a healthy relationship with discipline, but those who ignore correction will go astray. I know that was a little bit of a hard conversation, so let's go to the next one. It's a little more fun. It's the idea that we would be perpetually ready for memory making, that we would always be intentional about putting fun into our homes, building that into our relationships with our families. I was speaking to a friend of mine this week, and uh, actually many of you probably know her as well. Her name's Mars. She is uh, an Everett uh, community catalyst. She's this incredible person, and she's got four kiddos of her own, and so we were talking about parenting, and she said one of the things that she has taught her kids is that if anybody comes into the home, they're to be ready to drop whatever they're doing in order to make a memory. And I just thought that phrase was powerful, drop whatever you're doing in order to make a memory. It's just beautiful, it requires intentionality, it requires the, the eyes to see that this moment right here could be a beautiful moment to create something that lasts forever. I've, I, I've not been a, a perfect dad. Like I, I, I know you already know this, none of us are perfect. Uh, I, was, I was a perfect father and then I had kids and I recognize how difficult it was. It's so funny because as parenting is a little bit like a bowling score. You start with 300, but then as it goes, it just, your score just goes down and down and down. And so uh, I, I did one thing I think pretty well. And that was as my kids were young, when they were like toddlers through elementary school, every time I would come home from work, I would literally come in the door and the first kid I saw, I would just tackle and we would wrestle. And then the other kids would hear it and they would come thundering down the house. Dad's home, dad's home, ha! And we would all just jump in and dogpile and wrestle. And honestly, it didn't matter what they were doing. If they were doing homework, I'd slide the, I'd literally like off the table, you know, the books go and we're going, you know. Or if their friends were over, I'd just start throwing everybody on the trampoline. Like, like it just was so much fun because I wanted to like build in this idea that there's memories to be made. There's fun to be had, that that this life isn't all work and productivity. We can have fun along the way. That's what I think God desires for us. And what I want you to understand, and you might want to jot this down, is that quality time emerges out of quantity time. We really want the quality time. I know that. I do. I know you do. But the problem is kids aren't wired like that. You can't just demand quality time. It doesn't work, especially when your kid's four years old and doing dinosaur noises for 10 hours a day. Like there's not gonna be a lot of quality time. You gotta make sure that you build quantity time and then capture the quality moments. That's what it looks like. So spending more time with one another is a good way to ensure that you build that. I have a a pastor friend of mine has a definition for success in parenting and I'll just give it to you. I think it's really good. He says, I wanna parent in such a way that when my kids don't have to hang out with me, they would choose to hang out with me anyway. It's a pretty good definition. When they don't have to hang out with me, they still want to. And so again, and I've not done this perfect, but like over this last holiday season, my daughter, she came home for the holidays and 
And so there were a couple of times, but specifically one night we had a fire on, Christmas tree here, we're talking on the couch, and at, at some point in the evening I just noticed she's sitting next to me with her head on my shoulder. It's just this beauty. She doesn't have to do that. She's 24, and yet she chooses to. Or my son Caleb, I remember when he was little, I would do hours and hours of Hardy Boy mysteries with him. I'd read and read and read. Now he's a junior at Western Washington of Bellingham. And so he invites my wife and I up to his electronic dance music concerts that he hosts up there. And we go every time. Uh, we don't stay for very long, but, but we go every time. And, and it's just so fun that he doesn't have to invite us into that space, but he chooses to. Or my, my 19-year-old, the, the bad driver, he, um, <laughs> he and I connect over football. Like he, he played football, I played football, we love football, and so we're always watching football. Next weekend will be a great celebration. Like I just want you to see that it's just so beautiful that you parent in such a way that when your kids don't have to spend time with you, they still would choose to. And it brings me to this last thing. It's this challenge of reframing everything in the lens of God's love, reframing everything through the lens of his love. And what does that look like? That love that God has is the love that fills your heart and overfills your heart, that breaks your heart, that leaks love at the seams because you just can't contain it. You delight so much in your spouse, in your kids, in your parents. You you just are so thankful that this is your clan, this is your tribe, these are your people. God feels that way about you. That's why it's called the family of God. And it's just so beautiful. Uh, This Christmas, one of the gifts I got for my wife is I took all these old uh, video camera tapes that we had. We had had buckets of them. And I sent them off to this, uh, this thing and they sent back. It was all digitized. And so we were watching video after video of their young life, you know, what a, what a birthday looked like, what a, what a celebration looked like, what did a Thursday afternoon look like? Like it just was, I, I almost brought 30 minutes of video just to show you today, like that's the whole message, you know. Uh, you wouldn't have loved it, but I would have loved that. That would have been fantastic. But the point is, God feels that way about you. That your picture is on his fridge right now. It's hanging up under this little fish magnet, okay? Like he loves you. And his heart is so filled with delight for you. And that's why the Bible is unabashed in its challenge that we love him with that same kind of intensity and focus. And the scripture says this in Deuteronomy. It says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength. These commandments I give you today are to be upon your heart. It says, impress them on your children. That's what we're talking about today. What does it look like to build our homes framed in his love? Talk about them when you sit at home or when you walk along the road, when you lie down or when you get up. Tie them as symbols on your hands and bind them on your foreheads. What does that mean? Well, the symbols on your hands, that's representative of your behavior, the actions that you do, the way that you serve, the way that you care, the way that you hold, the way that you protect. All of these things are your hands working, What does forehead mean? It means your knowledge. It means your experience of God. It means you know God's love personally and you're able to convey it to your children. That's what it looks like. That's what we are to go after. So we reframe everything in the context of God's love. And this is the last vulnerable part that I I wanna be real with you on. As my kids... As they enter into adulthood, all three of them are hitting a few bumps along the way. All three of them. And, and they're kind of significant. And the reason why I don't share more stories from their almost adult life is because A, it's not as adorable as when they were four. And B, it's not my story to share anymore. This is their, their story. This is their journey. And, and I want them to be free to be able to walk and to discover what it looks like as they, as they figure out what life is supposed to be, what God has created them for. So I want you to understand it doesn't all look rosy all the time. And yet what I definitely want you to walk away with is your ability to reframe everything in the context of God's love. Because even as we deal with different challenges with different kids, I want you to hear me say we do it in the framework that God has made them, that God loves them, and God has a plan for them. That's true, 
And that's what you can do. And I, I say all this, we're gonna sh- watch a video right now and you're gonna see the power as somebody opens their life up to God and the change that that brings. So go ahead and watch this video. I grew up in a broken home. I, my parents split when I was four. My mom's family is the house where they attended church on Sundays. My dad, no, didn't have much of a faith. In fact, it kind of really built more of a resentment towards God or basically any religion. I had to grow up a little faster than most, some by upbringing, some by my own choices. I started using alcohol around 12 and got into more hard drugs and I was a full-blown addict alcoholic before I was 15. So I've done meth for about six years. I would cry out to God. At that time, I didn't know who, just, just cry out. Why me? Show me something, somebody, something. I, I really just didn't think there was a God. There was no way. I met my wife and we got married in 2016. I married into two beautiful little girls. Fast forward a couple of years, 2019, we had our son. My drinking, when it, when my wife and I were first together, it was more social than anything. Uh, and it escalated more and more. Rock bottom was for me, I continued down the same path as parents and the added stressors of becoming a new father and taking on a new career and having this extra weight of providing on my shoulders uh, amplified my habits. And I really knew when my wife came to me, not as, not to separate, but try to figure out what we can do to, so we can move forward or continue. And I, I had to get sober. I've been sober from alcohol now, two and a half years. And through that, I met another member of a church, this church. The first time, that he invited me to go to church with him. I said, oh, awesome. Okay, well, I guess there goes that friendship because I, I didn't want nothing, anything to do with it. He kept insisting that I come to his church, I come to his church. When I came to Life Point, I was shocked. There were people walking around with Seahawks jerseys, you know, and I did not get a single look coming through the door or a single thoughts were in my head of feeling judged, which is very rare for me. And for some reason, I came another Sunday. God just keeps showing me I'm in the right place. Yeah, one Sunday, Rusty asked everyone, anyone, that God was speaking to them. Just look up and said, I made eye contact. I remember he made eye contact and said, I see you. And I just felt this feeling of just, I don't know, relief. A weight lifted, that is the day I decided to fall God. I just decided that next week I was going to get baptized. I was ready to tell the world, I guess, that for my love for God. When I came up, I just felt relief of guilt and shame. There's no other way to describe it. Jesus to me is the, the highest sign of grace and compassion and, and love that there is. He's showing up for me every single day. I mean, I, I, what I hope you see is how God is continually able to transform a life. And then in this scenario, he transformed a life and it would transform the family transform the dynamic. I want you to think, some of you, you really grew up in homes that were, that were truly broken, dysfunctional, abusive, toxic. Like you recognize that and you know that. And I just want to say to you, God is more than able to cut that off. You don't have to pass it on. There's, there's healing, true healing available for you. There's so much hope that's available for your families. Literally a decision to just open your heart and walk humbly with Jesus can transform everything about your experience in your home, in your family, in your relationships. And so I wanna end very clearly by saying this to you. 
that God is for you. He is so for you. And you're flourishing and you're healing and you're abundant. He's for you. And he's for your spouse if you're married. And he's for your family if you have a family. He loves your family. He loves your marriage. He's for the flourishing of all of this. And there's hope available. Like everything can change today. Doesn't mean it's not gonna be a a road that you walk. Doesn't mean it's not gonna be a journey. Of course it's gonna be a journey. But right now, today, this could be the first step in that journey of healing and hope, of forgiveness, of peace, of joy. And right now, some of you, you're really, you're, you're disqualifying what I'm saying right now because you know it, it feels like you're stuck where you are. You know, it feels like it's just too tough. It's too hard. There's no way. So all I want to say as I close is you don't have to be the one that carries all of this on your own strength. The God of the universe, he wants to walk alongside of you. He wants to give you his strength for the challenges that you're gonna face. Now you love your family, he loves more. He loves you more. And so why don't we lean on his strength today? I'm gonna close with the scripture and then we'll pray. The Apostle Paul says, I also pray that you will understand the incredible greatness of God's power for those of us who believe. This is the same mighty power that raised Christ from the dead. In other words, the same power that raised Jesus from the grave is available for you and I to restore and redeem, to heal the relationships in our family. So why don't you bow your heads and close your eyes and let's just ask him for it. Jesus, thank you so much. Thank you that you are not only the model of what unconditional love looks like, radical acceptance looks like, sacrificial love that you gave and gave and gave so that we might have and live and grow. Thank you, Jesus. But not only are you the the model, you're also the strength. You also want to pour your power. You want to pour your courage into us. You want to fill us to overflowing with the source of all life, which is your love. And so we need that. We need that today. We need that in our marriages. We need that in our homes. We need that with our parents. We need that with our kids. And so Jesus, would you meet us? You know where each and every one of us are. You know exactly what we need. Right now, our hearts are humble before you. We're open before you. Would you just come? Would you bring your strength? Would you bring your courage? Would you bring your grace to each and every one of us today? We pray this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen.